about three ethical frameworks. Who can tell me one of them? Utilitarian. Thank you, Michael. Utilitarianism. And uh, Michael, can you continue? What is utilitarianism about? What's the goal of it? Like um, prioritising the results. Of Excellent. It's all about the results, all about the outcome. Yeah, yeah, I'll grab it in a sec. Grab it in a sec. You don't need it right now. You're not necessarily looking up the answers. Okay, uh, what, who can tell me another framework we've looked at? Virtues. Excellent, Mitchell. And virtues, are they about, what are they about in particular? Excellent. It's about the person and their dispositions towards certain actions. And there's one more we looked at. Deontology. Deontology. Flynn, what can you tell me? Deontology is about the process over the end goal or the character. Excellent. It's about the acts in themselves, okay? The acts being right or wrong. Then on Friday, Friday was a pretty heavy duty lesson. Pretty heavy duty for a Friday afternoon. I found it hard to get through. And then conversations were difficult as well. So we're just going to have a quick touch on it before we get into our issue that we're talking about today. So we said morality is either objective, that there are objective moral truths, or it's not. Okay, so not a black and white fallacy because they are two mutually exclusive things. It's either this or it's not this, okay? In the case where it's not objective, we say that it is completely socially constructed and conditioned. There are no objective moral truths. So we have argument, um, what is, what is objective morality? There are moral facts, moral questions have true answers. What is relativism? There are no moral facts, there are no true answers. It's all just my opinion or how I feel about it. Okay, so we looked at four arguments for uh, relativism. So the first one was that morality is socially constructed. All right, that's sort of true in a sense. Your parents and society conditions you how to behave. But then we said just because something's socially constructed doesn't mean it's relative. Okay, the example I gave was about uh, maths, that you go to a maths classroom and you're conditioned into believing these laws of mathematics, but they are objective truths. Okay, so we're saying mate, just because something's socially conditioned doesn't make it relative. We have the second and third arguments quite similar. Cultural values differ from culture to culture, therefore moral rightness differs from culture to culture. So we said if, you need to, if you're going to maintain that, that means you view slavery and infanticide and the Holocaust and the sacrifices of the Aztecs as all fine. That's morally permissible because that's just how they did it back then and where they were located. Um, we have people have different opinions, what's right and wrong. All right, we can't, we can't always agree on everything, therefore there's no truth with it. Okay, so a problem with this argument? Well, people have different ideas about whether the earth is flat or round, therefore there's no truth. Okay, so it sort of seems like a silly argument when you put something else in there. And that can be a really good way for you to think, think of ways to challenge arguments. You say, what is the core thrust of the argument? Here it's saying, you can insert anything in there. People have different opinions about this, therefore there's no truth of matter. You can put anything in there. People have different opinions about lots of things. That doesn't mean there's no right or wrong uh, to it. And then the last one, a society that sees morality as relative is more tolerant and inclusive. They're more likely to accept everything. All right? And that's sort of saying tolerance and inclusivity are good things, maybe objectively good. What were some arguments we looked at before? Objective morality. Um, we said everyone has this innate sense of uh, rightness and wrongness. All right? We said think of... Back on the playground when you were a kid and someone pushes in front of you. That's not fair. It's unjust. Um, and so we're saying that until we're inferring from that, therefore an objective moral code exists. Okay? So I was talking with Flynn about it. I think me and Flynn had a good discussion about it. We said, you know, look at this whiteboard eraser. The reason we can all agree that it exists is because we can observe it through our sense organs. Our senses describe some objective reality to us. Does our moral sense describe some reality as well. That's the argument here, an argument by analogy. We have physical sensations of things that exist outside. We have an internal moral sensation of ways to act. Can we take what is common across all of that and infer that that is how we should behave? Um, then the next argument was, well, what about moral disputes? Anytime you're having an argument with someone, you need to have an idea about what is right and what is wrong. You need to have the same idea. Otherwise, you can't have an argument. So the example again was from maths, a prime number. If you're gonna argue about what a prime number is, 
You both need to have an agreement of what constitutes a prime number. If you don't, then the dispute is fruitless. You can't get anything from it. And then the last argument we put forward was to try and tug at your heartstrings there. We said, if you really believe morality is relative, then it means you can do anything. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, you can't condemn anyone. You can't praise anyone. You can't condemn Hitler and the Holocaust. You can't. Um, so we're sort of appealing to what well, seems absurd. All right? It seems absurd to say. Um, it's an appeal to absurdism. So there were three arguments for morality being objective, and we looked at four arguments for morality being relative. And it was good to see we had sort of an even mix of it. It was interesting that when we came to the lesson, most people were sort of pretty willing to say, oh, it's just relative, I'm just conditioned into believing it. Um, but it's good reflecting on the arguments of it. Okay, today we are talking about uh, abortion. So it, this is a very divisive issue, okay? Um, and maybe you guys don't have particularly strong opinions about it yet, but definitely um, the more the older you get, you find people are very polarised about it. And some people are very much pro-life, and some people are very much pro-choice. And it's also a debate where language is um, is really used in um, in what I would describe as an illogical way. Okay, that it's more about um, it's more about power with the language than about truth. Okay. So, example, abortion is health care, okay? Abortion is health care. Everyone deserves health care. Everyone should be able to take care of their health, all right? The opposite end of the spectrum, abortion is murder of babies. We shouldn't murder babies, okay? So look at the different language that's been used there. One's about health care, and then one's about murder and murder of babies. So, um, I think it's important to come to this discussion with the sort of history of abortion law and how it's sort of come about. So we have contraception and the pill sort of in their infancy, the pill in particular, in, the, in its infancy in the 1950s. All right, and then that segues into the 1960s. What is the pill? But it is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a piece of medicine that basically prohibits someone from getting pregnant, okay? So it means that uh, they, um, yeah, it changes their body chemistry so they can't get pregnant. So we have that sort of happening in the 50s, and then you have the sexual revolution in the 1960s. If you were to pick a decade to go and observe some pretty amazing stuff happening, 1960s, it was all happening, all right? What happened in the 1960s? You've got the Beatles, you've got the Vietnam War, you've got the moon landing, you've got Woodstock. Who's heard of Woodstock before? Okay, Wood, yeah, Liam, do you know what it is? I've just, I've just heard about it. I don't really know a lot about it. Yeah. Like, it's I, like, yeah. I just keep hearing its name brought up lots of times from the 60s. Yeah, it's, it's like the first music festival, okay? And it was organised at a guy's farm, and he just had heaps of people rock up, way more than they anticipated. Um, and it was just like this massive party that they had, heaps of hippies, heaps of drugs. Um, and that was sort of the first music festival. Um, and in there, there's all people experimenting with drugs and sexuality and so forth. So all that's sort of happening in the 60s. And you find a real abandonment of sort of traditional modes of being. All right, so traditional ideas of family and so forth. That sort of changed in the 60s. Okay, so look at what we've got. We've got sort of women, um, some would say, gaining autonomy over their bodies. So they can choose when and where they're going to have children. Okay, that's, what, that's the purpose of the pill. Okay? And they're sort of moving into, um, moving, generally speaking, more away from being a stay-at-home mother to more getting into the workforce. Okay? So you have that all happening around this time. But the pill doesn't work all the time, and contraception doesn't work all the time. All right? In fact, I think with condoms, the success ratio is about 97% of prohibiting pregnancy. And with the pill and so forth, if you use things um, together, well, I'm not exactly sure, but it's not always successful. So let's take the example of condoms. 97% successful, which means 3% of the time, someone's going to get pregnant when they don't want to. Okay? So they didn't want to get pregnant. They've had sex. They didn't want to get pregnant. And so now they've got this pregnancy that they don't want. They don't want, they're not ready to have a child. Um, and so you have, this is a major case in America, taken to the Supreme Court, this is Roe versus Wade. And I'm talking specifically about the history of America here because what happens over there tends to sort of unfold here. Okay, so Roe versus Wade is the Supreme Court case where they said, 
abortion is a woman's right in 1973. So that's sort of the history of it. That takes us to 1973 where abortion has been is legalised. So in, um, in Adelaide or in South Australia, abortion, um, so in 2019 they changed it. Abortion was legal up to 24 weeks. Okay. Now abortion is legal up to 40 weeks of pregnancy, which is full term. So as long as the baby's not born, the mother can still choose to abort. Okay, so what is an abortion? Uh, so an abortion is a medical process of ending a pregnancy so that it does not result in the birth of the baby. Um, <coughs> that photo there is a baby at 24 weeks. So at 24 weeks, a baby is generally viable. That is, they can survive outside of the womb without too much, too much intervention. Um, but yeah, so now, now in many parts of the Western world, it is legal up to 40 weeks, provided there's sufficient justification. Um, so what's it say? It considers here woman's current and future physical, psychological, and social circumstances. So here is the main argument for uh, in favour of abortion. And so this is put forward by a feminist in the 1970s called Judith Jarvis Butler. So can we have those sort of three paragraphs read? Uh, Oscar, could you read the first one for me, please? She wake up in the morning and finds herself back to back in her bed with an unconscious violent. Uh, a famous unconscious violent. She has been found to have a fatal kidney. I don't know what it's going to be. Yeah, and the Society of Music Lovers have canvassed all the available medical records and found that you are my The director of the hospital now tells you, look, we're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have committed it if we had known. But still, they did it and the violinist is now stuck with you. The unplugged you will be to your home, but never mind, it's only for nine months. By then, he will have become conscious family and can safely be unplugged from you. Excellent. So, they're painting a picture here of someone who doesn't want to be plugged into this violinist. Okay, they've just woken up and they're plugged in. So it's a thought experiment, isn't it? They're plugged in, they have to stay there for nine months. All right? And so the, the appeal of this argument is, well, you wouldn't expect someone to have to go through that. The conclusion, therefore, you, it's, it's similar to pregnancy, therefore you can't expect a woman to go through it if she doesn't want to. Okay, that's the sort of main thrust of the argument here. Um, there will be some questions where we can unpack that a bit more. The other side says, Abortion is murder. That was sort of the way we described it. So murder can be a loaded word, but let's try and come up with a suitable uh, suitable definition of it. Because if we're saying abortion is this thing, we need to check out, well, what does this word mean? Okay? It certainly means more than killing. All right? It certainly means more than killing. Okay? For something to be murder, it has to be, yeah, you know, it involves the killing of something. It stops living. But... You could say if you kill someone in self-defense, that's not murder, is it? All right, you've sort of they've tried to attack you and you've sort of fended them off and they've died. You didn't intend to murder them. So what else do we need to add to it? Um, something about like how it's the end of a life. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So do you think that's that like killing is is super way to describe the end of life? Or I'll, I'll put that up here, like end, end of life. Yep. It's ending the life of that living thing. Yep, Flynn? Murder has to be intentional. Spot on, I think you're, you're correct. That it has to be intentional. So in the, in the circumstance of someone attacking you, all right, and you sort of just defending yourself, you wouldn't say that you intended to do it. Yep, Alex? Uh, unjustified. Unjustified, excellent. Um, so that it, you have no justification for doing it. Yep, so unjustified. So what about in the circumstance where... Um, uh, let's say, you know, because you, you could you could come up with some examples where it might be justified, like um, you know, someone's kid got run over, and so they seek revenge by by killing the person who run their kid over. Okay, so some people might say that's justified. Some might say it is. Um, it, it isn't, but 
I think perhaps in here, as a caveat to this, it needs to be sort of innocent, doesn't it? The, per the person who's being killed is completely innocent. Okay? Um, murder, killing, end of life, unjust, but I think these are all good. This sort, of, sort of needs to satisfy all of these. I think there's one more thing though. Okay, um, if I went out rabbit shooting and shot a rabbit, did I, did I murder it? Some, some people would say yes, <laughs> all right. Um, but generally speaking, when we're talking about murder, we're talking about human beings. Okay, so let's look then um, at, at abortion, okay? And let's see what, which of these does it satisfy, okay? So, abortion is intentional. Like it's a procedure that people go and perform. Is it killing and does it end the life? Well, that, that's the purpose of it, isn't it? It's, it either, if you see it as a human or not, it doesn't matter. It's a living entity, and then after the procedure, it is no longer living. So, it is killing and it does end its life. Unjustified. We'll not leave that one there for now. I hadn't thought of that as a word before. Um, but maybe that sort of ties in, ties in with innocent. Is, uh, is, the, uh, is the fetus innocent? Yeah, well, it hasn't done sort of anything wrong, has it? it hasn't just... So then really the last thing it needs to sort of I mean, you, you could say, I think you could argue that it is unjustified because it hasn't committed any crime. That it's innocent and it doesn't deserve to die. It's a, it's a living thing that doesn't deserve to die. So it could be that way of arguing. The, the last question, is it a human being? Okay, so this is the crux of the abortion issue. Is if the fetus is a human being, look, it's, it's satisfied all of these others. If it's a human being, then any act of abortion is murder. Right, so this is where the debate lies, is, is the fetus a human being? So I said, yeah, I, this is what I come up with, and I think we've got a good justification of this there. So if murder is the intentional killing of an innocent human being, is abortion intentional killing of an innocent human being? Right, so this is the last thing we sort of need to debate. So why should we believe it is? Okay, so we're going to look at arguments for being a human being and arguments against it. Okay? So the first thing is up there in the corner, I've got a piece of sperm and an egg, okay? So you can see very clearly, we have sperm and an egg, how many entities exist? Two. We have one packet of DNA and another packet of DNA. All right? They unite, the sperm fertilizes the egg, and you have what's called the zygote. How many entities do we have? One. We've got one biological entity. At this stage, it has the entire genetic code for a unique human being. That dictates their eye colour, how tall they can potentially grow, what hair colour they're going to have, all those kinds of things is in that packet of information. All right, so it's got the entire DNA. So we have, yeah, prior to conception we have two, but then throughout, all right, throughout we have a zygote, and then throughout its whole existence, as a fetus and as a human being, as a child walking around, you just have one entity, okay? We go from two things to one thing for the rest of its existence. Okay, um, so one argument against this, it's got the entire DNA, all right, is um, everywhere you go, you're shedding bits of skin and hair. And there, that's got your entire DNA and entire genetic code. So should we preserve its existence? Okay, so what do we think about that as an argument? Is, um, is a skin cell the same as a zygote? So yeah, so we're shaking our heads a bit. They're, they're different in that they have um, like different potentials, don't they? So a skin cell is not gonna grow into a human being. But a zygote, given if you give it the, uh, you know, give it a proper environment, give it nutrition um, and time, so you can call that the net test. Nutrition, proper environment and time, it will grow into a human being. A skin cell or a hair follicle, whatever it is, given nutrition, environment and time, it's not going to grow into a human being. Okay, so there's a potential difference there. 
All right, um, so that was one argument against that, we have that. Okay, and then the, then the argument is like, it, it's just metaphysical. We've got two things and then one thing throughout its whole existence. And so then it says any other demarcation point, so a demarcation being when it transitions from being um, not a human to a human, it's saying it's just arbitrary. You're just making that up for convenience so that you can, you can make these choices. So that's, that's why, some reasons why we should believe it's a fetus, uh, it's a human. Why not? Okay, the first argument says it is not fully developed. Okay, so that's very true, it's not fully developed. Um, is that a good reason for terminating its existence? Okay, or what, what does it Im imply? So certainly, um, you know, my, my children at home, I've got, you know, 10 month old babies, two of them, I've got a three year old and a five year old. It's saying the less developed they are, the more okay it is to kill them. All right? Um, I might be jumping ahead a bit there, no, I'm not. Okay, so one argument here is it's okay if it's sort of done a bit earlier. The earlier it's done, the better. Well, that's just saying the less developed something is, the more appropriate it is to kill it. All right, that we hold the same proposition with regard to children. Okay, the second one, the fetus is dependent upon the mother for survival. Okay. Very true, all right, it's inside the womb, it needs the mother in order to survive. So do um, infant babies when they're born. They need a mother or they need someone to care for them. Uh, the fetus is not mobile, okay? Again, you can make the same argument about a infant baby. It's not moving, it can't move itself around and take itself to the toilet. You make the same argument about a human being that's a quadriplegic in a wheelchair but they can't move themselves, does that mean they're not a human being? Okay? Um, fetus can't feel pain. Okay, it can't feel pain. There are some people that are born with a condition where they can't feel pain at all. And it's really dangerous for them. They like burn themselves all the time and they cut themselves and they don't even know it. Um, so there are people that exist that can't feel pain. Does that mean they're not human beings? And then the last one, the fetus doesn't have a heartbeat. So you can detect a heartbeat from about six weeks onwards. Okay? But again, what's the implication of maintaining this? If someone's heart stops, okay, the ambulance come along and try and get their heart going again, are they not a human being for that period of time when their heart stops? Or do they still maintain their humanity? So it, this, is, this is the crux of the issue, and that's why it's so divisive. I think you can make, so what, what's the pro-life uh, pro case saying? It's saying, look, you've got the entire DNA of a human being, you go from two entities to one, um, and that it's one entity throughout its whole existence, and any, any other demarcation point is arbitrary. So this is the syllogism. All abortion is willful killing of an innocent human being. So where, where do people debate that? The human being part. All willful killing of an innocent human being is murder. I think people are generally pretty happy with that definition of murder. So it's, Difficult to contest the second premise. You may want to add more detail or less, but generally, when people just fight to fit this argument, they go after the first one. Okay, that so that's a that's a reasonably strong argument. I think this one's a little bit stronger. Okay, so what do the pro-choice and pro-life arguments value? Okay, so let's look at this pro-choice. Okay, what about the life of the mother? Okay, what about her, the quality of her life? She's not going to be able to, let's say it's a young teenager, she's not going to be able to go to university. She's not going to be able to pursue her career. What about her life? Okay, so that's, that's the question it's asking. And then what about the pro-life side of that? They're saying, what about the life of the baby? It doesn't have the opportunity to exist. So when, we, when, we, when I say both of those, can we see what do they have in common? What are they sharing together? What do they both value there? Okay, pro-life. What about the life of the mother? Pro-choice, sorry, pro-choice, what about the life of the mother? Pro-life, what about the life of the baby? What's common? Life. Value of life, isn't it? Absolutely, value of life is common to both. All right, so one of them, if you think of the pro-choice, uh, pro value of life of mother, and in particular, 
it's talking about going to university, pursuing a career, um, health, whatever it might be. It's talking about the qualitative, qualitative aspects of her existence. Okay, qualitative aspects of existence. I'll write that up. Okay, and then you have the pro-life, and so that's valuing the life of the baby. Alright, so we've got valuing the life of the mother, valuing the life of the baby. This isn't necessarily about the quality of life, this is about the existence, the opportunity to exist. So one values quality of life, the other values existence of life. What's more primary? Existence of life or the quality of your life? So this argument says existence has to precede quality because in order to have any quality of life, a good life or a bad life, you first need to exist. And so metaphysically, what's more fundamental? Existence. And so I was making an argument that they, should, they both value life. What's more common? Exist, what's, what's more fundamental? Existence of life is more fundamental than the quality of life. Okay, so we're going to look at some objections for both. Um, first one, my body, my choice. Okay. Um, so one simple argument might be, yeah, you know, that your body, but inside your body is someone else's body. Right? That's another person's body. Again, that points out the argument. Is it a human being, is it not? Um, women's rights. So I found this out the other day. So you might say, you know, 50% of people that are born are male, 50% are female. So with regards to abortion, more abortions occur for females. Um, and that's even the case in the Western world, that more females are aborted than male. It's not a huge difference, it's like 51, 49%. But, so women's rights, yep, but 51% of people that are aborted are women. Okay, um, it's okay if the abortion is performed, performed early in the pregnancy uh, as it is less developed. Okay, what's the implication of that? Well, it's okay to kill, it's better to kill someone when they're younger than when they're old, when they're less developed. Sure, abortion is bad, but it's justified in circumstances of rape and incest. Okay, so this may be a true point, but it's not relevant to the debate that we're having here. We're talking about abortion as a means of contraception. And when you look at rates, we don't record them in Australia, for privacy reasons, but in America, okay, 1.5% um, of abortions are because of rape and incest, okay, which means 98.5% of abortions are means of contraception. It's because I don't want to have a baby right now and the contraception didn't work. I willfully engaged in sexual intercourse and got pregnant and I'm not ready to have it yet. Okay, um, what are we up to? Uh, abortion is okay as long as it occurs before the baby can feel pain and has a heartbeat. We sort of addressed them already. We said just because something can't feel pain or doesn't have a heartbeat doesn't make it not a human being. Uh, what about this one? This is one you hear a bit. Men can't have a pin an opinion on abortion because it's a woman's issue. Okay, so, I mean, again, you could say, well, 50% of, um, or 49% of babies that are aborted are men. You could also say, what does, does the argument hold up? Australians shouldn't have an opinion about the Jewish Holocaust because it's a Nazi, it's a German problem. All right. Australians shouldn't have an opinion about some atrocity happening elsewhere because it's an issue that's to that area, that belongs to those people. Uh, last one. We don't really know if the fetus is a human being or not, therefore we should allow it. Okay. So let's say, again, you go on hunting, you go on rabbit shooting, we're going to stick with that example. You go on rabbit shooting with your friend Bob um, and you hear some rustling in the bushes. Are you just going to shoot the bush and hope you get a rabbit? <laughs> you might shoot Bob. It might be Bob in the bush, okay? So the point of this argument is to say, if you don't know if it's a human being, it's better to err on the side of caution because you might be killing a human being, okay? So let's look at the opposite end of the um, pro-life objections. Okay, so these are pro-life things they're saying. I'm glad I wasn't aborted. It's certainly a position I hold. I, I value my own life. Um, perhaps you guys feel the same. You, you like your life, and so you're glad that your parents didn't abort you. Isn't that? Don't we have good inductive evidence to suppose that those babies that are killed would value their own existence? 
And sometimes people will make arguments about if this baby's born, then it's going to have a poor quality of life. Okay? So look at many babies in the third world born into poverty where they're struggling for food and water and shelter. They, they, they don't have many of their basic needs met. Right? They're born into these circumstances. But what do these people do? They still strive. They're striving for life and for happiness and they're pursuing that which is good despite the horrible circumstances they're born into. Isn't their example that they're pursuing that they're still that the very fact that they haven't killed themselves isn't that good evidence that they value their life regardless of the circumstances they're born in that their existence again existence is more fundamental than their quality of life they still value their existence and then the last one have sex when you're ready to have children okay so that's that that might seem like an, an obvious resolution okay that why why is abortion legal well it's because of uh, contraception and you know the idea of bodily autonomy that we can control our bodies but we can't always control them because sometimes it slips through and in fact 98.5% of abortions it slips through when we don't want it to okay so and then, then and then he so so there we've painted some pretty rational cases so here's, here's a bit of an emotional argument maybe one you haven't heard before this is a statistic you can get from um, World Ometer so this year, it's, it's got the, the number of abortions that are occurring, okay, this year. So far, so we're in October, we're at 34 million. So the projected number of abortions for the year is just over 36 million for the whole year. Okay, well, that's worldwide, not in Australia. 36 million human beings. Um, and the, the, the liberal estimates of the Holocaust, okay, the Jewish Holocaust, so that's the one that would, you know, sort of the one that people would point to and say, this is the worst atrocity in human history. Six million Jews. So we have, if, I mean, if you think of that mathematically, six million, six Holocausts occurring every year. Yeah, so, all right. So, it, it, it's a, um, it, it's a pretty tough issue. It's fairly divisive for some people. We're trying to be as rational as we can about it, aren't we? We're trying to move away from um, sort of that sort of loaded language of, of um, you know, murder of babies and. Um, healthcare, and we're trying to say, well, is it is it a human being? What's the what's the reasons for believing so? What's the reasons for believing it should be um, should be okay? Um, and so then, what we're going to look at is these frameworks, and how do these how do these frameworks answer this question? Utilitarianism said the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Okay, do we include the fe the, the the baby or well, fetus in that count when we're counting um, how many people we're trying to satisfy their the, the outcome as good, do we include babies? For Kant, if we think of deontology or Kantian ethics, okay, we have killing is wrong, but it's not necessarily killing, but it's murder is wrong. Intentional killing of innocent human beings is wrong. Okay, that, that's an act that is wrong. Um, natural law we haven't talked about. Virtue ethics, okay, um, is about character disposition. And I was trying to think, what's a virtue that's sort of reflective of this? I think temperance is one. Okay, because well, what is temperance? It's like everything in moderation. It's not like let's just overindulge the senses and let's just not indulge the senses at all. It's like in the middle. And so that, that's talking about don't have sex until you're ready to have children. So let's uh, pull our question books out. It's a pretty heavy duty one. We'll come around, have a chat, see how you're up with it.